Dr. Mullen and I are so happy to be with you today because we truly believe that reading is a civil right. And part of our work has been on building systems of literacy for everyone. Um, and so I told my mom that I was going to do this because I tell my mom everything, right? And so I called my mom and I was like, hey, I'm going to kick off this reading event. And she's like, wait, weren't you a math major, Tanya? I was like, yes, mom, I was. But reading is everything. In science of reading, I've come to learn is everything. So just a couple quotes to inspire us here. Frederick Douglass, once you learn to read, you will forever be free. And Margaret Fuller, today a reader, tomorrow a leader. I truly believe that at my core. Yes, math is important. We need the, we need numeracy skills in our lives. But if you can't read, you can't access the world. So on my journey, <clears throat> I have been changing lives through literacy for years. First, I started at School 29. You see this little eagle down here. Um, when I became the principal of School 29, zero proficiency in ELA and math um, across our school. Within uh, three years, we were able to grow that in ELA from 6%. And by teaching kids how to read, we also impacted our math scores by 6%. But all I did was reading intervention. Of course, good math instruction was happening. But when you teach kids how to read, they can access everything. And so I didn't even know what I was doing, to be honest with you, when I entered that space. Again, I was a math major. I was mostly secondary. I entered this world of elementary school. And my teacher was like, yeah, she's reading at a level J. Oh, yep, that little boy's a K. And I was like, yeah, but I listened and they can't read. So what we're doing is not impacting their ability to access text. So we brought in things like 95% foundations. Um, I went on the What Works Clearinghouse. I was like, somebody help me. And we brought it all. And we were able to teach our kids how to read. Um, and so that's how we had impact there. Fast forward a little bit. I went to East. I was the middle school principal there. And again, my whole purpose there was to move my kids out of middle school into high school as readers. And so we did the same thing there. We met demonstrable improvement. That's New York State language for like, you're on a list. You need to get off the list. And this is what you got to do to get off the list. We did that for three years in a row, mostly based on our reading. And it had impact on our graduation. Within five years, East moved from 33% graduation to 85% graduation. A lot of that is a result of teaching kids how to read. Um, and then, you know, I took a leap of faith and went out to the suburbs. And I was like, oh, things are going to be different in the suburbs. The triangle is going to look like the triangle is supposed to look. But then I got to the suburbs and I was like, oh, oh, we have issues here too. There's kids that can't read in the suburbs. I, I just, and for whatever reason, I thought things would be completely different. We have more resources where I work now to teach kids how to read, but we still weren't doing what we needed to do for kids. We weren't having solid tier one um, instruction. And then we also were missing intervention. And so kids would go to intervention. You'd stay there for basically ever, right? So when I got there, I realized good reading instruction crosses every area, demographics, income. It doesn't matter. Kids need to learn how to read and be taught how to read. So I started a journey. Who's listened to Sold a Story, the podcast? Okay, who got really, I'm going to, who got really pissed off when they watched Sold or listen to Sold the Story. Yeah, like I texted one of our friends who's not here today, Jess Jones, and I was like, I'm so pissed off. I'm yelling and I'm like hitting my steering wheel as I'm driving to work. Um, I just felt like literally I had been sold a story and I had shortchanged kids for years, including my own children as I reflect a little bit. Um, so that is really powerful. If you haven't listened to that podcast, please do. It's so well done. And then I also got to watch two times now A Right to Read amazing documentary. And again, LeVar Burton, who we love, Reading Rainbow. But we really need to do that, right? It's that simple. We have to teach kids how to read. It's it's really that simple. So at, in Fairport, we're on a journey right now. We have 75% of our elementary teachers trained in volume one of letters. Um, and then we are continuing that work. We're moving that up through our K-12 system because literacy doesn't just live in K-5, it lives K-12. So we're working on that throughout. And we really have dived into our language comprehension and our word recognition, bringing in um, programming. And I'll just show you a couple stats real quick. Last year, we had early adopters of our new programming. I'm not even going to name them because it doesn't matter as long as they're grounded in the science of reading, right? So we have a phonics program and we have a comprehension program that our students use. Our early adopters, those classrooms, they outgrew their peers by 25 points in reading and 50 points in writing as measured by IXL in one year. That's pretty amazing. And then if you look at these, um, just these numbers here, from this fall, we had 23% of our students as measured by Ames Web falling in the red category, 10 percentile 
So 23%, that should be one to three, one to five in a healthy system. So not quite healthy yet, but from fall to winter, we reduce that to 15%. That's from solid tier one instruction and solid intervention. That's all you have to do. And it's simple and it's exactly what we need to do. So here's my litmus test. Not only do I get the privilege of leading Fairport, um, well, sub-leading Fairport, thank you, Superintendent Provenzano, um, but I also get the privilege of raising these three beautiful children. So my oldest, Maddie, is a junior in high school. Um, they go to Greece, Athena, or she goes to Greece, Athena. My middle guy, I'll talk about him in a second. And then the baby, Asha, turns five in a couple days. She's in pre-K. I am so blessed to raise these kids and to influence everybody else's kids in our system, but they're, they're my litmus test. Is the product I'm putting in front of my students at school good enough for my kids at home? And my little guy, Tavi, is in first grade, so he's right in it. He's learning how to read, and I've brought home the decodables to him. He loves them. Um, it's It's been really great, and he gets these three get the privilege of having a mom that has an understanding of how to teach kids how to read. One of the things I love about Just Right Reader is that that QR code on the back equips all of our families to have the knowledge that I have as an educator. Um, and then the little one, I'll just tell you this, she's a, she's a whole vibe, the little one. Um, but she, ha she just carries around the little kindergarten decodables in her backpack to UPK. She'll pull them out. She can't read. She doesn't have letters on. I'm not even worried about it at all. She shouldn't know that yet. But she loves holding those books in her little hand and they're just there's just a perfect fit for her. So that's been wonderful. But I just want to end with saying reading, raising readers is not for the faint of heart. This is a collective effort and we need our families to help us in doing this work. But we also have to equip our families with the skills to help us. We can't just put the burden on them. So I'll leave you with Barack Obama and hand it over to my dear friend, Dr. Barbara Mullen. Yay. Oh, very. I love it. So first I'm going to, before I go into my slide deck, I am going to one shout out Bessie Jean Greco. Hello, Ross Sherry. We're not as deep, but my ALA director is here. And hello to my amazing literacy staff who are watching. Um, and it's okay. We'll bring you some cookies back. It's fine. You know, you're doing, you're in the buildings. It's okay. Um, we're, we're a little far out there, but I want to just name that Whenever there is something that gets this much oxygen, right, your governor is talking about it. I'm surprised that it wasn't in the like State of the Union address last night. But everybody is like, signs of reading. Do you know the signs of reading? And I'm just like, so reading. Because there, there is, right, research, there is science, there are all these things. Um, and it is controversial and it is a civil right and it is tied to that. And it is really complex work. It is. But it's not, as they say, rocket science. It's not, oh, impossibly complicated work for practitioners. You all are experts. You know this is the right work to be doing. It's the people work that's involved in it, right? It's the people work. And so I first want to name that when Tanya asked and Jennifer and Sarah said, hey, do you want to do this, this um, webinar, or this uh, like lunch and learn? I said yes, because there's very little that I would not do for great people doing great work, but you need allies in this work. You need to find your people. You need to find people who believe in the work that that you know is right for children. Um, and you need relationships because you can truly feel isolated. Our educators can feel isolated in the classrooms. Um, they can feel at odds against each other. Sometimes our parents can feel very, very isolated. I started as a special education teacher and reading specialist and parents were crying in IEP meetings. Parents were so frustrated. They're so scared because as Tanya said, if you don't have literacy, you are locked out of our world and any, and any ability to contribute to it. And so you need to find people who really um, think like you uh, and maybe think differently than you to push you, but folks that you can trust and have this work. So for that, Tanya is, is my person in that. And I thank you for that. Um, so I want to talk about my time in RH district. I'm going to bring it from the superintendent lens about creating the conditions for this work to really be lifted and sustained, right? Because I come from a parent from educators who are parents. My mother is a retired special education administrator and teacher as well. And she will tell you her first year in the classroom was 1974. And she will tell you it goes like this. It comes and goes and comes and goes and comes and goes. And when this goes, not a if, but when 
it goes and then comes back, we will still need to have had a system that sustains the work. And so I start by just talking about our journey um, and honoring and celebrating the work of a district that I've been able to inherit and to join in that community. So we had some goals in our H and district priorities, that beautiful little button face baby there. She's adorable. Um, we have beautiful children. I'm sorry, I just love them. Um, but safety and wellness, student learning and equity and inclusion were our district priorities that's capping out this year. So I came in and I said, hey, what are we doing? I'm going to do it too. Let's, let's, let's go full throttle. And so under our student learning priority, we knew literacy um, was a particular um, area of growth. And so our um, lovely retired ELA director here um, really led a lot of the great work. So an emphasis on letters training that was happening already. Um, Jeanette here, the writing across the content work. Um, And our intervention work was already happening when I got there. Um, And we saw really great growth for many of our students. Um, And so when I got there, I said, you know, I just I met this woman and this organization, Just Write Reader. um, And I would love to be able to use some of our funds at the end of the school year. I started in April. It's almost been a year Woo! Um, to be able to send these these decodables home with our families. We were coming off of our remote learning academy um, and really thinking strategically about how to continue to support our readers at home. And so we were able to send home these kids um, and immediately I got emails from staff, from principals, from parents saying, thank you. These are great. We appreciate these. These are awesome. Um, And thank you for just caring like as the superintendent of schools, thank you for being an instructional leader. Like, you know what we do? Yes, I do. That's my job. And it is one of my favorite parts of the job is being in the thick of understanding what my adults need to do their best work for children, which is literally why I come to work every day. It's about the kids, but I've got to do it through adults. And I've got to make sure that the conditions are right for the adults to do their best work. So we sent these kids home. We were so excited. We took a little picture. um, And that was really our way or my way of continuing to show as a new superintendent that I valued and honored the work that my team had done long before I got there. I didn't just discover science of reading and say like, y'all, we need to do this. Um, Because I would have been a little tone deaf. (laughs) So um, thank you. Thanking them if you're watching. Thank you for that as well. But then we came into Vision 2037, which is our strategic planning process. So we'd had district priorities, but we'd never had a long range strategic plan. And as the superintendent, my board of education charged me with saying, the world is changing fast. Things come and things go. We need an anchor or for RH's stance. We need a lighthouse. We need something for us to keep coming back to as these waves of innovation come and go. What are we going to stand on and what is our North Star or our direction? And so we started this campaign because 2037 is the year that our UPK kiddos graduate. So this is an academic generation. So it's not enough to be able to say, okay, K through three, what's literacy strategy look like? How are we building a love of reading and literacy and language and more importantly, storytelling and story developing over the time that we have students? And so we've landed so far where I'm so proud of our team. We have, we're almost to the end of it because I know everybody loves to watch board meetings. We'll actually ratify our strategic plan in April at the board meeting when it's just about finished. But we landed on five, on full, four goal areas and under excellence for every student, we're going to sustain and further develop our culture of academic distinction by championing the potential within every student. And so what that looks like, we were bold and we were very clear. We will elevate instructional excellence and each student's educational journey by focusing our efforts on the science of reading instructional best practices and then some other things down there. But for this conversation, we put that there and we named it. We said, this is what we believe. It's not something that we're going to, oh, we want to learn more about. This is the work that we do. And so I thought, well, the science of reading requires us to understand the soul of reading. And that is a very different thing when we're talking about people work and conditions for the the technical work to happen and stick. And so for me, I take it just like Tanya back to my own experience with my child about how he really struggled to flourish as a reader. And so we have other goals, but I go to this foundation to flourish for all students. 
in here in this goal, a lot of people talk about culture and climate, but I wanted to name that we are committing for every student's engagement to be ignited and positive behavior is naturally fostered. How many of you all hear that um, Maslow's before blooms? I'm sorry, I'm gonna openly and publicly reject that. It's and, right? Because I believe that you'll get that. You can cover a multitude of neural pathways that have been broken by trauma, that have been broken by unfinished learning, by engagement that's ignited, right? By a nurturing and inclusive atmosphere that affirms the individual child in front of you and resonates with them in their appropriate growth and celebrating them. And that's what Just Right Reader does with their culturally affirming readables and why I was so excited. And yes, I started with my baby, my son on the side. I am invested in this journey um, in RH. And my son was a struggling reader. He was one of those COVID pre-K babies when all of that language was needed. And, and, and my husband, who is a network architect, was home with him and YouTube. <laughs> Blink. And I was out here putting out COVID fires, right, as, a, as a, an equity officer and a chief cabinet member. And what I learned through this process was that, yes, there are some very technical components, right, of the reading uh, structure that we want to think about. But when we talk about the soul of reading, right? The soul is that almost other part of your being that needs to connect. It's not even so much as of adaptive thing. It is more of that like purpose driven element. It's the thing that lingers after all of the technical, physical stuff is gone. It's that thing that drives you. It's who you are almost. And so with my son, two things were very apparent as we began to prepare him for reading and to become a reader. That language comprehension must be partnered and paired with culturally affirming instruction. When you think about what's required, background knowledge, the multiple literacies, the, the funds of knowledge that our communities bring, especially our English language learners, there is an inherent discrepancy at times um, and conflict between letters and ENL best practices, right? And language acquisition and language development work. And so we have to really be thoughtful when we talk about this, that we think about culturally firm, affirming instruction because vocabulary, language structure, our literacy knowledge, our our inferences, how we make meaning of the world is all cultural, right? There's something I learned about the word finna. All right, I'm finna see y'all later. That is a uniquely AAVE, African-American vernacular term, copacetic. Oh, that's all copacetic with me. I'm good. AAV term. So when we're talking about language comprehension, it's cultural. And it's important that when you think about the soul of education and teaching children how to read, that you don't forsake the nuance in this component. And then the last is word recognition. My son does not like you, period, until he loves you. <laughs> he just don't like you until he loves you. It's just the way it is. And so he had to have trust with the adults because how many of you know that learning language is difficult? Not learning how to read, learning language is difficult. And it is so scary. So you must have psychological safety and trust when you are teaching phonological awareness, talking about decoding and sight recognition. Kids have to feel safe to fall and fail. And they have to trust you and know, even especially when they're older, that if they say the thing, how it doesn't sound, it's okay. It's okay. And so when we talk about the soul of reading, those are the conditions, how we build this internal locus of motivation, control, and aspiration for our readers to be lifelong readers, to get to the good stuff. You've got to have these two pieces here. Now, y'all don't steal my stuff. This is an emerging frame, but the soul, just cite me, okay? The soul of reading is really about these two areas, right? How do we get through to our learners? And so... I'll leave you with this. Personally, it is a journey. I don't know anyone who can't think of a personal connection to why getting this right and deeply investing and supporting the science of reading is, is critical. But it's also not a static journey for us. We had to develop as leaders our understanding. We have to develop 
um, our comprehension around what's at stake. But for my executive leaders, cabinet or above, who are watching this, this is not just about practitioners. We control the purse strings. We control the master schedules. We control the staffing. We control the transportation. We control the facilities. We control the all those things. And if you're not anchored in your why, why another reading specialist is critical, why coverage is critical to get your buildings out, your teachers out the building for um, letters training or other training, why resources are important, why we need to have effective communication strategies with families, then you are not going to have the impact you need. And right now, there is a gap in being able to help our superintendent friends understand this work. So you know, it's not just who we are, but who we have to be in order to get this right. So I want to share my journey. Thank you so much, everyone. Our citations. And now I'd like to introduce Laura. I'm sorry that I cannot remember your last name at the moment. <laughs> but thank no you for joining us. She's going to tell you exactly who she is. <laughs> yeah, and she's going to get it right. I have an intro slide and everything. Don't worry. All right. I've got this gone. But yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. That was so fabulous. I love hearing, I, I, you know, I'm Laura Tortorelli from Michigan State University. So just, you know, over Canada, uh, not far away at all. And I love hearing about all the wonderful work that has already been going on here. Um, so I really appreciate that intro. That's the, the best intro that we could do. I'm going to take a minute. I'm going to spend a little time just talking about my perspective on the science of teaching reading. And that's a little bit distinct from the science of reading. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I have a PhD in reading education from the University of Virginia, and I've been working at Michigan State University since 2015. I teach in our very large teacher preparation program. So I think a lot about how to get teachers on board with teaching reading in evidence-based ways. Um, and I also do my own research on how children learn to become proficient readers and writers, like how we get them from that little bitty alphabet book stage through to that stage where they're like lost in a book. Um, and then uh, particularly um, about the complexity and difficulty of informational texts and how we can support children to read those. Um, and then how digital texts play, are starting to play a larger and larger role in that classroom work. Um, so you can see here, and I'm also um, and currently an editor of The Reading Teacher. I don't know if anybody is a, is a fan of that journal um, where we try to get research findings out to teachers. Um, so what I'm gonna be talking about today um, is includes, my perspective on the science of reading um, that has come out of all this work that I do with pre-service teachers and work that I've done in Michigan as we've tried to improve our reading instruction there. Um, and I'm going to talk about some myths around the science of reading that I have seen um, kind of bubbling up on social media over the past few years. Um, and then talk about what I what we what you can look for in high quality instructional materials that support teachers in doing this work. Um, I don't like to think about it as like we're going to purchase the right materials and then the teachers will do everything right. Like we're going to set them straight. You know, I, I really think about mis instructional materials as being um, supportive of teachers as they try to do um, improve their reading instruction. So um, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, but I really want to I want to talk about where this comes from. So as I said, I moved to Michigan in 2015 and we were already doing the science of reading panic. We just didn't call it that yet because we our reading scores have been going way, way down in Michigan. There's been like a precipitous decline even before the pandemic. Um, and so I don't know if you heard about this, uh, about this story, but yeah, Detroit public schools were actually sued by parents for not teaching their kids how to read. Um, and so we had some legislation um, that w our third grade reading law that was going uh, that threatened to retain students who were not reading proficiently by third grade another year in third grade. Um, obviously, nobody wanted that to happen, and so many many things, other things, started to happen to prevent that retention piece. And in fact, we've actually rolled back the retention part of the law, but we've kept all the good stuff that happens before um, kids get to third grade. And so there, we have seen some progress here. But so I got to be really involved in our statewide response to this law, like almost as soon as I came here, we I, I have helped um, develop our early literacy network and build up a, a, a network of reading coaches to support better instructional practice. So this is something I've been working on and thinking about and was doing that long before this Emily Hanford uh, uh, op-ed appeared in the New York Times, like, pointing out that we had all been teaching reading the wrong way. So I, I was already, we were already sort of thinking about this. Um, I didn't really, I, I liked this op-ed. I did not expect 
like the firestorm <laughs> to come out that has happened since on social media, where the term, the science of reading, has kind of taken over and is now taking up all the oxygen in the room. So I, I, I agree with it. Um, but in some ways, I saw it as a continuation of the work that people in my field were already doing rather than this big new thing. Um, but since then, um, it's really taken off. There is, I think, uh, science of reading legislation in 32 states right now. Um, and as you know, um, there have been a lot of changes here in New York. Um, New York is trying to um, prioritize this science of reading back to basics reading instruction. And, you know, there's still some ambiguity about what that's going to look like. <laughs> um, it's great for the governor to say things. Um, you know, what it, what happens next is that the, de the devil will be in the details, as they say, right? So um, I think it's a great time to sort of talk about this. I know you have these reading, these literacy briefs that are supporting you in this work that Noni Lasso and her team um, have pushed out to the state this this uh, this year. And these are all, these are great. I love Noni Lasso's work. Um, we have something in Michigan called the Literacy Essentials that I think are nice compliments that are about things that you can do in the classroom that are evidence-based every day. So this is a good start. Um, but then I also kind of worry about stuff like this. It's like, here are the three curricula that will solve your problems, right? Uh, that's a very normal phase. Uh, we've been doing a lot of curriculum adoption in Michigan too. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this too. Um, but really the question, that this is the question, right? The governor wants this to happen, is it going to happen? What does that look like? Um, and so I want to share sort of what I've learned from our journey in Michigan in case it's helpful here in New York um, about the science of reading. So just to zoom back out, I, I, what I hear when with this, in this conversation is often that we say that we are doing or we're not doing the science of reading, right? Or we're going to start doing the science of reading. Like it's something we can just like purchase from, you know, Heinemann and it will be done, right? Um, and this is what what I really, when, when I'm referring to this term, what I think we're trying to get at with this term is really a body of research that underpins everything we're doing in the classroom. Um, so when we think about, you know, there is, we, we're really lucky to have this research. Reading is one of the most studied human psychological phenomenon um, in our history. So we know a lot about actually what's happening inside a reader's brain while they're reading, and that's phenomenal. But um, what you'll notice is that, like, here's some, like, key sort of science of reading papers that are foundational to my field. But what you'll notice is that this is cognitive science and neuroscience right? This is psychological, that the psychological research. A lot of this is um, eye tracking studies where like you watch a reader's eye and see what how they process the letters and the words that they're reading. Um, there's a lot of like brain, you know, brainwave mapping where you put like electrodes on somebody's head and watch what parts light up when they're reading. So it's fascinating stuff. Um, but it, it's not necessarily classroom based, right? There's a big gap between what I think of as the science of reading and what actually teachers have to do every day. And in fact, they would agree with me. <laughs> um, if you look at the authors of these foundational pieces, when they write about the science of teaching reading, they have very different titles. Like you'll notice there's like, how should reading be taught, question mark. <laughs> and uh, lost in translation, question mark, challenges in connecting reading science and educational practice. Um, scientific and pragmatic challenges. Um, so basically, what I want to start with is that I think we should all, um, you know, this, as Barbara said, this is a people endeavor, right? And we need to come to this um, from a state of grace. It's not that anybody has been trying to do it wrong or hurt kids, right? And it's not that it's easy. I think sometimes the science of reading labels slapped on things to, in, to be like, well, why aren't we doing the science of reading? We should have been doing the science of reading. But actually, what we have to do is the science of teaching reading. And that is that is not as, that is straightforward as the science of reading, right? Those are actually two different things. And, um, you know, Seidenberg agrees with me. Perfetti agrees with me, right? Um, so when we get into the science of teacher reading, that's what I say I do, right? I, I study how kids learn to read in school contexts and how we can improve that. Um, but that's social science. Right. So, you know, I'm sure you've seen this a million times. Right. Um, this is a wonderful example of like our scientific reading literature. Um, the, the simple view of reading, which is that reading comprehension is the product of decoding and linguistic comprehension. Um, and this is all over Facebook and all over social media as though it is the answer to a question. But it isn't the answer to the question because it's a measurement model. Right. It tells us how we can predict any kids, any given kids reading comprehension. But it doesn't actually tell us where to enter to start to improve that. And it certainly doesn't tell us how to do it over time, 
right? It's not an instructional model. Um, I've definitely seen schools try to take this up as their model. Um, they're like, well, we're going to teach decoding over here for 90 minutes, and then we're going to teach linguistic comprehension for 45 minutes, and then we'll have the science of reading, you know? Um, and that's not how that that's not how this could be read, right? Same thing with, uh, I've also seen people try to read it like left to right. Like, well, we're going to focus on decoding for, you know, in kindergarten and first grade. And then when they get to third grade, we'll focus on language comprehension. And that's also not some, like a way that we can that we interpret it best, right? This is um, a really wonderful way of capturing the reading process, uh, but it doesn't actually tell us what teachers need to do, right? Um, and so what I wanted to do is instead take it, to zoom out on some theories that actually do help me understand um, what teachers need to do. This is still the science of reading, but I think the science of reading that's a little bit more nuanced and can help us understand what actually has to happen in classrooms. Um, and so I really, th there are three major pieces of building um, a reader or building, like I was at a, a little PBS documentary that was called Building the Reading Brain, right? Like these are three major pieces to building a reading brain uh, that I think are really helpful to think about in addition to things like Scarborough's Rope and um, the Simple View of Reading, which are, are fab fabulous models, um, but can be misinterpreted <laughs> um, in an instructional context. Um, so first, we have to do this orthographic mapping piece. This is getting more popular now, which is great because I love Linnea Aries' work. She is a New York uh, scholar also. Um, and so the kids do need to understand letters and sounds, right? Phonics is absolutely crucial. Alphabet knowledge and phonetic awareness are crucial. Um, sometimes I think we misunderstand that as being all that the science of reading is about. Uh, but this is this is foundational. So kids, but the key thing is that kids use that letter and sound knowledge to map words, right? It, they don't. It's not that they just need to be drilled on letters and sounds. It's that they then need to use them to actually decode words and make sense of the words. So for every word that they need to read, they need to go through a process of orthographic mapping, where they map the letters in those word in the words to the sounds that the letters represent in those words. And that is variable from word to word, right? So cat is a pretty simple word, but it, the sound k can be represented by a C or a K, right? So to learn the word cat, you have to hear that sound, remember which letter is going to represent that sound, and that's the way you're going and, and, and go and work that work your way through all the sounds in the words in that way. And that's how you're going to retain that word in memory. Um, and recognize it in future encounters. Same thing with rock, right? Rock has that k sound again, but it's represented by C and K together. Um, and so you have to figure that out and process that in order to read that word again in the future. The word said um, has a weird short E sound in the middle of it that's represented by AI. Um, so that's not a letter sound correspondence you will, you will have learned, but you still have to process it in the context of the word to remember that word for future reading opportunities. So this orthographic mapping piece is actually the important piece. It's not just phonic, what we think of as phonics instruction, it's going, it's how, using it to read words and make sense of those words. But it doesn't stop there. We also have to connect those orthographic representations to word meanings. And this is where that oral language piece is so important early, right? We can't just focus on decoding and then focus on oral language or later. We really have to be braiding them together. Um, and Perfetti's work and many other people's work have really highlighted that the way we hold words in memory is through this orthographic and phonological representations and putting those together, but then by connecting them to the meanings of those words, right? Um, because that's what makes it meaningful and important to children, right? Why do they care that R-O-C-K represents rock unless that means something to them? Um, and so the way words are, are retained in memory is actually through um, knitting together all of these identities, the sounds, the spelling, the different meanings that the word can have, and then the different um, formations that the word can take, different derived forms of the word, so that all of those can be connected. And when a child sees that word in the text, they can figure out what the context appropriate meaning is. Like, is this about a stone? Is this about rocking back and forth? Or is this about a type of music? Um, and so when kids are encountering words and decoding them in context, they're able to build up their high, higher quality representations of words in memory and use those to make sense of what they're reading. Um, and that process gets more and more automatic as they have more high quality encounters with words. Um, but then 
um, they need to do this over and over again over time. So it's not just about getting high quality phonics instruction at the beginning of school. It's not just about um, using that to decode words, but it's about having lots and lots of opportunities to do that millions and millions of times with, mil with millions and millions of words. And so what I really see the K-3 trajectory as being about is kids having those structured scaffolded opportunities to build their reading fluency through encountering and orthographically mapping and making sense of work, of all these words. Um, and so when kids first start to do this work, it looks messy, right? The kids are kind of like, ah, and you're like, oh, this is going to take forever, right? This is no fun. Um, but they have to kind of go through that phase. Um, and over time, and you know, the, and they're not, their comprehension is not great, right? So it looks bad from a meaning perspective. You're like, is this fun? I don't know if this is fun. Like their ruler, it's like every word is taking like 30 seconds to read. And it's just, they're not like, and they're not making that much sense. It's like, I don't know if this is working. Um, but in fact, what's happening is that they are doing that orthographic mapping and connecting to meaning that they have to do to build their reading skills. And they're kind of switching their intentional focus back and forth. Like they have to decode the word, then they have to make sense of it. They have to decode the word, then they decode it, read a sentence, then make sense of it. They're sort of like switching intentional focus back and forth. But over time, as they add more and more words to their mental lexicon, that gets auto that process becomes automatic. And that's what we call reading fluency, right? So then they can actually decode, they can um, read text without having to stop and decode every word. Uh, the word recognition becomes automatic and all of their attentional resources can just be focused on enjoying the text, learning about the world, building up their interest, you know, figuring out, following interesting stories and that kind of thing. So those are really the three things we're trying to achieve um, when we're talking about supporting kids in the science of reading. Um, and we know that kids really do need to have this automatic word recognition by the end of elementary school, um, because if they they aren't able to read most words at first sight and decode longer words and figure them out when they encounter them by the end of fifth grade, um, they don't have a lot of comprehension growth after that. Like the chart is like, if they don't ha meet that threshold, they sort of just like hover out, hover around at the same level of comprehension through middle school and high school. Um, and the authors of, of, these, of that research um, estimate that about 30 eight percent of fifth grade kids are not uh, not meeting that threshold right now. So they definitely they, this is really important for supporting their future reading growth and enjoyment. Um, and we also know that um, if kids get really good, high quality instruction that supports orthographic mapping, connecting to meaning and reading fluency in the early grades, um, many fewer of them will be um, diagnosed with reading disability later. Um, there are a lot of kids who show up in third grade or fourth grade diagnosed with dyslexia who really have what Nell Duke calls dystichia, which means they just didn't ever get the <laughs> support. Dystichia, yeah. They just didn't get the instruction that they needed um, to get to become fluent readers. Um, we also know, and that, you know, this is related to what Barbara was saying too, that, um, and uh, Tanya also had the, the stat that like, if we can increase reading by third grade, kids are much more likely to go on to graduate from high school. Um, there's a very strong correlation in the research between early reading success and later academic success. So, um, so we want to make sure we're doing all of these things, um, but uh, and and because that that's really how we're setting kids up for to have this rich experience in school. So um, we're going to switch to talking about some. So we we all agree we're going to do this. This is great. We want to do science of reading, um, but there are still some concerns. I don't know if you if everyone's on board in your districts or if this, there's some trepidation about what this might be like. Some concerns. Raise your hand if. You or you, you know people who have concerns about the push for the science of reading. Some concern, <laughs> resistance, concern. Yeah, we'll call it, we'll call it concern. You know, it's coming from a place of concern, right? Right? Yeah. So, I, I I talk to people a lot who have concerns about the science of reading movement, about what that might mean for classroom instruction, who might be left behind. And so I have come up with some myths that I, I've heard. Um, and in your tables, I'd love for you to talk and, uh, and indicate if, uh, and talk about whether you've heard these, right? Um, so the three one, three of the, there's more than three, but the three that I, I've been hearing recently are first, that teaching aligned with the science of reading it makes students hate reading, takes all the fun out of it. Um, two, that teaching aligned with the science of reading is only appropriate for white middle class English speaking students, that it's not culturally. Um, affirming and culturally relevant. 
And three, that teaching aligned with the science of reading means adopting specific programs. Like you have to buy Haggerty, you have to be Orton Grilling Am trained, you have to buy EL education, something like that. So in your turn to your table and, and talk about whether you've heard the, any of these. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, go white. Yeah. <laughs> I have to wear the green dress, you know. <laughs> I have to represent. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. 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 See. I kind of want to see. I know. I know. My husband went to the senior night of hockey game, but he was crying. And I'm like, we didn't even go to school here, but he just loves it. Like, we're, yeah, we're just very, we're, we're very embedded in the community. We live right next to campus. And so, yeah, we love all that, all that hoopla. It's really fun. All right. Um, ha, who's heard number one or some version of number one? This is going to take all the fun. Yeah, yeah. Don't okay. Great. I appreciate you rejecting that. So ju just to give a little for uh, a foretaste, this is a, has anybody ever played two, two truths and a lie? Yeah. So this is sort of our own true truths and a lie. Like with, in my opinion, two of these are totally false and one of them, we still have some work to do to make it false. Um, and so, um, and so that's part, the second part is where I'm going to make you guess which one is the which, which uh, so it's more like two myths and a maybe. Which was, but so we, we Tanya thinks this is number one is definitely a myth. And it, um, how about number two? Has anybody heard number two? Is that in Michigan? Okay, you've heard that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, not appropriate, not for, for, uh, middle class or white, but for English language speaking students, or even as I say, like students who have other cultural vernacular. Mm -hmm. But what what the point is, is that you can't teach it in isolation of understanding language development. Mm -hmm. So if you're a reading teacher, you must also be skilled in language development if you are going to be culturally responsive. It doesn't mean that it's not good. It means you it's not done in a vacuum. So that would be my guess for the maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And how about number three? Teaching a line with the science of reading means adopting specific programs. So you're just going to buy it and then you're done. Anybody heard that? Yeah. Do we think that's true? Okay. We're, we're sure that that's a myth. Okay, great. <laughs> All right. We, are, we don't think it's... Okay. Okay. So we think... You, you guys are actually very good at this. All right. So here's my answer key. Yeah. I do... I, I'm with Tanya. Um, so the research is clear that teaching alive with science reading does not make students hate reading. I'm not saying it couldn't be done in a way that made students hate reading, but that is generally not the outcome. Um, what we find is that teaching alive with science of reading actually really supports reading motivation and self-concept throughout the elementary grade. 
Um, and what we know is that kids start kindergarten super motivated to read. If you ask kindergartners what they're going to do with school, they say they're going to learn to read. Um, the parents think they're going to learn to read. Everybody's all jazzed up for it. And then it doesn't, it, sometimes it doesn't happen or it doesn't happen right away or there isn't enough support and there's a little struggle. Um, and what we know is that um, things start to go uh, start, things start to go, go south for a lot of kids very quickly. And so in kindergarten, the amount of reading skill you have and how much you like reading are totally uncorrelated, like no relationship at all. But every year in school, they get closer and closer correlated. And what by the time kids get to fifth grade, middle school, um, reading skill is basically synonymous with reading motivation, right? Those are the same construct. In fact, I recently got a paper returned to me by an editor who was like, you're talking about reading motivation like it's a separate thing, but it's just reading skill. And I'm like, okay, okay. But like uh, in instruction, it can be different, right? You can motivate kids in different ways, right? But over the lifetime, how well, how easy reading is for you is going to predict how motivated you are to read. Um, and this is important because we then get into a virtuous cycle, right? Kids who feel like, who um, are, kids who are good at reading um, will do a lot of reading, right? They, they, kids who, do, like, kids who are good at reading are motivated, they like reading, they do a lot more reading, and then they get even better at reading, right? And it becomes this virtuous cycle. Um, uh, Miyamoto, the author of this paper, actually describes um, what she sees in secondary students, which she calls a vicious cycle, which is the other way around, right? Kids feel like they're not good at reading, so they avoid doing reading. I know you I don't know if you've ever seen a third grader pretend read, right? They're like, mm, what, what page is everybody else on? Flip, flip, flip. Mm. <laughs> like they do anything they can to avoid it because it feels bad for them. And then they don't miss those opportunities to increase their reading achievement. And then they get even less motivated. It becomes a vicious, vicious cycle. So what we want is for kids to be on the right side of the cycle, right? Feeling good about reading. So they'll be willing to do, engage in lots of practice, improve their skills through that practice, and then feel even better about reading. So um, that's what the research says about that. So Tanya was right. Number one is a myth. Um, I have a little uh, exercise here to make the point. Um, have, are, are any of you familiar with uh, the Japanese alphabetic syllabary systems? They have three different ones. It's very complex. Don't let anybody tell you that English is the hardest language to read. There are many hard languages to read. Um, so this is one of their alphabets. It's called katakana, and it's used to, it's not really an alphabet, it's a syllabary, right? Each character represents a syllable, and it's used to write, to um, depict words that have Im been imported from other languages. They use a different alphabet for words from other languages than from like native Japanese. It's very complex. Yeah. And so um, I just went through a typical informational text here and replaced some of the harder words with words written in katakana. Um, so go ahead and take a minute in your tables to read this and see if you can figure out what it's about. Mm -hmm. There's like a little katakana translator online if you ever want to try it. It's kind of fun. Yeah, it's fun. So. So the reason I, I do this is because this is what research shows us that kids who are are not great, you know, below that decoding threshold are experiencing when they read. It's not that they can't read anything. You often have teachers tell you like, oh, they can't read at all. And you're like, well, by second grade, third grade, actually, they can read a lot of words, but they can't read the important words, right? The new, harder words. Like many, many kids kind of go all the way through elementary school with this level of decoding skill, right? They can read high frequency words. They can read short words but they never quite get to the point where they can tackle these harder, longer words. Um, and it's very, very difficult to figure out, to learn from an informational text if you can't read those longer new vocabulary words. Anybody have, have an idea what this is about? Mm -hmm. Hurricanes, yes, the power of hurricanes, that's right. Um, this is about, and yes, that word is the equator. Very good. Is this, uh, so should, you, should we keep going? You want to keep going? No? no? Keep going? Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is, this is how those kids who are fake reading feel, right? They're like, ah, oh, it's so much work, and I'm getting so little back, right? Um, do you feel motivated to read right now? 
Do you feel like you want to keep going and uh, answer a bunch of comprehension questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not it's not great, right? This is so yeah, reading motivation and skill are very highly correlated for obvious reasons. Um, and what you see when you look at like the NAEP results, for example, is that it's not just that, you know, a third of kids typically score below basic, the same third of kids tell you that they can't read it. Like they know that they can't read it. They don't feel good about their reading, right? Um, and to me, that's almost a more important stat um, than just whether or not, like how well they're performing on a test, how they feel about their own reading is uh, really telling. All right, so number two, this is indeed the maybe. Good job, <laughs> Barbara. Um, teaching a line with the science of reading is only appropriate for white middle-class English-speaking students. Um, this is, doesn't have to be true, but I do think it has to, we have to figure out how to make this more culturally accessible and supportive of linguistically diverse students. But I understand why people are concerned. Um, if you look at those science of reading leaders, um, they are old white guys, right? <laughs> um, those people that we're all talking about. Um, but uh, it, it isn't true that all that research has only been done on white kids and white classrooms. In fact, one of the very first studies of the simple view of reading was um, a study of English Sp Spanish bilingual children, right? So it's not, if there is research that can inform us. We have to make sure that we are building it into our, our work um, with not just, I mean, appreciate what Barbara said about the work, uh, building that into the language piece, right? The language comprehension piece, but also making sure that we're being culturally affirming and supportive, even in our phonics and phonemic awareness instruction. Um, and there are fabulous scholars who are working on exactly this question, how we can do this better. Um, this is Julie Washington, Catherine Rhodes, April Baker, April Baker Bell, um, <clears throat> and Terry, um, and Nicole Patton Terry. Um, are all fabulous scholars who are particularly looking at how students with who speak African American vernacular um, can be better served by phonics and phonemic awareness instruction. So more things are coming. Um, Here's some of the things that I, I've learned from their work. Um, a lot of things can be the same, right? We we absolutely want to make sure we have explicit and systematic instruction. Um, we want to have a lot of the same interventions and components, and we want to make sure we're balancing foundational skills and comprehension and those two strands too, right? Like decoding and language comprehension all the way through. Um, but some of the things that make the, make, can be more important for linguistically diverse students is that we are not just talking about one thing at a time, right? So we're not just s phonemically segmenting words into like lovely Alcona boxes, but that we also talk about what those words mean, right? Um, and use them in meaningful contexts that can help connect students who may or may not feel connected to the language of it, like, the language the teacher is speaking for their phonics instruction. Um, lots of connections between the oral language um, and vocabulary pieces that you're teaching and the phonics instruction. I often see these done as like completely separate components. We're like going to decode a bunch of words over here and then we're going to do language instruction over here. But helping kids bridge those two things is very important for kids, for, for linguistically diverse students. Um, and making sure that we're progress monitor monitoring and um, setting appropriate assessment targets that we don't just like have one sort of like bad assessment because they were confused by how you were saying words or whatever at the beginning and then just place them in an intervention group and never see them again, right? But we're actually like paying attention to the progress that they're making and recognizing it when it's happening. Um, and some of that has to do with our assessment tools, which need to be more culturally um, and linguistically diverse also. But some of it's just like making sure we're really tuned in to what they are doing um, and can see and seeing what they're doing throughout the instruction. Um, so we do want to make sure we're still doing that orthographic mapping, like helping them connect letters and sounds. Um, but we want to make sure we're not changing or fixing children's speech as part of this instruction or denigrating their language when we're doing this instruction. Um, I've definitely seen kids, teachers who want to do like phonemic awareness, make the kids say the word they the way they say it. Be like, no, 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 you're saying it wrong. Say it this way, say it this way. And spend a bunch of time getting them to say the words the right way before doing the phonemic awareness. And you don't have to do that. Julie Washington wrote a really nice piece for the reading teacher about this, um, where she's like, well, let's say you're doing a code in boxes and you say the word field and somebody else pronounces it feel, right? They don't pronounce that final D, right? It, one of your students doesn't pronounce the final D. Do you tell them they have the wrong number of phonemes? No, there's actually four. You said there's three, you're wrong. Or do you, do you say, oh, the way you say it, there's three, you're right, feel. The way I say it, there's four, yield. 
And when you see it in, in you, when you see it in text, you're going to see that D on the end, but you don't have to say it if that's not how you say it, right? Um, so she has a really nice piece in the reading teacher, kind of unpacking how we can do this better. So I think it, we definitely can do it well. I am worried that when we get really focused on the nitty gritty of phonics and phonemic awareness, that we'll forget that that has to be connected to kids' language and make sense to them in their own language. So that's that's why I have it as a maybe. I'm not. I want to make sure we keep that forefront. Um, and then. The last one, I, I'm glad we all agree, this is definitely a myth. You do not have to adopt a specific program to teach and align with, align with the science of reading, but you do need high quality materials, right? So what I was talking about with my table back, back there at lunch is that um, we don't wanna adopt a program in a really heavy top-down way to like fix our teachers, right? And fix their instruction and like fix everything that's going wrong. But we do wanna make sure they have what they need to do scientifically uh, based in rating instruction. And those are really two different things. Um, so for me and for the, I actually got to serve on the committee where we picked a new reading curriculum in my son's district. And for me, it was really seeing that how much work the teachers were having to put in to creating high quality lesson plans and phonics materials and that kind of thing when that wasn't available to them. So I really see it as providing them with materials that are, they're gonna use um, that are gonna help them do their jobs better but not necessarily that are gonna solve all the problems. <laughs> and in fact, um, what I, we also found was that there was no perfect curriculum, right? And there's something wrong um, or not a good fit for your district, um, no matter what you end up picking. Um, but so I, there is a lot of change in curriculum right now in Michigan, and I know that's gonna be true here too, uh, where there's new sources of funding, focus on pan pandemic recovery, legislation, social media, frustration with the results, all of these things are pushing us to pick new things. Um, and so I wanted to share some of the tools that I use sometimes to help districts evaluate possible curricula that they or materials that they might want to purchase. Um, this is the Ed Reports, the Reading League, um, and the IS uh, tools. Um, and then also, but I also want to highlight that every it's not science, the science of reading is not just about aligning your curriculum to, you know, a particular um, on, you know, to a particular set of teaching principles, it also really needs to be culturally responsive. And unfortunately, none of those rubric, curriculum rubrics actually integrate that. But there is a separate curriculum rubric developed at by NYU that is available to help you um, kind of think through that. And for our district, that was really important to make sure that we evaluated both and integrated both because there were some programs that we really liked as far as, you know, their um, foundational skills or whatever, but we didn't really like all the books that the kids were being offered to read. And so, um, <clears throat> and that, so that's like, uh, because they didn't represent the, the community of our school district. So that's something to think about as well. Um, but also kind of zooming out and thinking about what teachers need to support them um, in doing the work. So you might already have materials that already, that, or that do a lot of good things, but there might be specific gaps um, so rather than throwing everything out, taking stepping, taking a step back, I recommend taking a step back and sort of thinking about this um, from a structured literacy approach. Um, so structured literacy, like a lot of people say they're doing the science of reading. I don't really say you're doing the science of reading, right? Like I say, we're doing things based on the science of reading. Um, but one thing, so, but, and so sometimes I say it's, you know, teach, the science of teaching reading, but another term that I think that I found very helpful in talking to teachers and districts is this term structured literacy. And structured literacy is an approach, right? It's not a program. Again, it's not like TM, you go buy it. Um, but it's a way of thinking about your literacy instruction holistically and making sure that you're getting explicit and systematic teaching in all of the important components, not just phonics and phonemic awareness, but everything that contributes to reading, you know, in the Scarborough's row, um, and making sure that all that the components um, that we focus on decoding, spelling, oral language, vocabulary, and reading comprehension. Um, and that there's this explicit teaching where teachers clearly explain, model, and engage in gradual, gradual release of responsibility around all of these components, and that it's systematic. There's a sequence of instruction with easier things taught before harder things. Um, and so those key principles have helped us. Um, you know, in, in districts that I work with, I evaluate what we have, and what we need to supplement or add or change. Um, and so this is a, this spear swirling model of structured literacy um, can help you figure out where those gaps are and address those. Um, it's not always the case that you need to throw everything out and start all over. 
Um, <clears throat> and another thing that I really that structured real literacy really emphasizes is that you want to have high quality materials and for teachers and for students. It really emphasizes the books that we put in front of students and how those instruct and support our instructional goals and align with the rest of the instruction. So I don't know if anybody's seen this yet, but I now that people are not doing guided now they're now that we're doing science of reading, we have you know, our 20 minutes or 30 minutes of phonics instruction, and then we go right back to our guided reading groups. <laughs> Anybody seen that? Like, the kids are, I, I actually was in a classroom in Michigan recently where the teacher was trying to do small group phonics instruction, great, um, but the thing that the kids were supposed to do while she, the other kids were supposed to do while she was doing the small group phonics instruction was um, to read independently from their level book bins. <laughs> and you're like, oh, uh, this doesn't really work. So something that's an important component of like a structured literacy approach is to make sure that you have the teachers and the kids have the materials in their hands that they need to do the work. Um, so sequenced phonological awareness and phonics materials. I know that teachers can make their own phonics lessons and materials, um, but it is so much homework for them. And there's, there are many great programs out there. I know Tanya mentioned foundations. Um, it's not that anything is perfect, but just giving them something to start with and allowing them to think about how they want to tweak it or improve it um, is really important because every day you need a new phonics <laughs> lesson, right? Every day you need to be moving on to a new thing. And that's a lot of work for them if they don't have really high quality materials. Um, but you also want to make sure that all the activities that are built into the program support the orthographic mapping piece. Um, and that the books that they're getting in their hands are aligning with all that work and aren't working against you um, when you're actually sitting down to do that reading. So you want the reading and the phonics instruction to be coordinated, and you want to make sure kids have lots and lots of opportunities to build their reading fluency through applying those skills. Oftentimes, really like well-intentioned programs come with like two books for every lesson, and that's not going to get us there, right? Kids need to read so many books to build up that reading fluency and encounter all of those words. Um, and so that making sure that if you, if, I will say like, if you have a choice between spending money on like a brand new ph phonemic awareness curriculum and books for kids to read, like the books for kids to read are often the, the most important, the thing that's most lacking um, in, your, in your classroom, especially if you've had a guided reading sort of approach in the library for a long time. Um, so when we're thinking about what these high quality materials are, we want, things that connect to these three parts of, the, of learning to read. We want things that support orthographic mapping, that support kids in making meaning out of their reading attempts, and to uh, give them opportunities to be, build reading fluency. Um, so when we, something that I always suggest, this is, uh, our, I'm gonna, is that we think about this in terms, of, we look at our, what we currently have, or what we're thinking of adopting, and we look for things that we don't want. Right, because we're always asking teachers to do more. We're always saying, add this, add this, add this. But actually, it's really ho important to think about what we don't need to be doing and what we can take off their plates. Um, and so I've come up with some, well, I didn't come up with this, but I, I apply something called the Brown M&M test to curricular materials that we're either using or thinking about using. Does anybody know the story of the Brown M&M test or where it comes from? Okay, it's, uh, it's from Van Halen. Um, when, he used to be when he was touring, he had a very long contract because apparently, I've never been to a Van Halen show, but apparently they're very technical um, and there's a lot of pyrotechnics and smoke and like speakers and like flying through the air and things like that. And so um, he apparently had like a 50 page contract for venues where he was going to perform with like bullet points all the way down every page. Um, and one of the bullet points said that he in the green room, there had to be a bowl of M&Ms with all the brown M&Ms removed. Um, and, and like everyone, like this sort of got out as a story of that, like, you know, oh, these rock stars, they think they're so special. They won't eat brown M&Ms. Um, but later he explained in an interview that in, because the, the contract was so long and technical, he needed some sort of like immediate way to see if they had read it, right? <laughs> and so he was, he was like, oh, I can just walk into the green room. And if there's brown m and in the bowl, I have to go through and check everything, right? Because this, the person who put this together did not read the contract. And that's sort of how I feel about the science of reading, right? There are certain things that if they pop up your curricular materials, you're like, ooh, maybe I need to go back and do some more thinking about this, right? So I have brown M&Ms for um, a couple of key areas that I, I that I, things to look out for that you can kind of 
put aside and not do if they're part of your curriculum or might be a sign that you want to replace a particular thing. Um, so when we think about phono phonological awareness and alphabet instruction, um, if you have, it, like, when I think about brown M&Ms, things that make me concerned about the materials and whether or not their teachers have what they need to do good reading instruction, um, I think about oral only phonological awareness activities, um, things that emphasize songs and rhymes, especially in kindergarten. Preschool kids, songs or rhymes are fine, but by the time you get to kindergarten, you need to be doing some phonemic awareness work, right? Um, emphasizing letter names, but never getting around to the sounds. Um, doing a letter a week, moving really slowly. Um, doing lots of crafts and songs and stories around alphabet instruction instead of just direct explicit instruction. Um, little opportunities for repetition or review or not enough handwriting practice. Handwriting is so bad. So bad, kids are not getting enough handwriting practice. So any, so these are sort of my brown M&Ms. What we do want is we want to keep that orthographic mapping piece forward, right? What is it that's going to help kids do orthographic mapping with the words they encounter as early as possible? Um, and so what we are looking for is phonemic blending and segmenting, right? Working with those small sounds and having kids split words into them and blend them together to make words. Um, we want alphabet instruction and phonological awareness to be integrated. We don't want to do them separate. We want to make sure we're thinking about sounds and words and mapping those to letters as often as possible. We want to be pretty fast because if you think about a letter a week approach, we take almost the whole year to learn the alphabet. <laughs> so we want to learn at least a letter a day, sometimes more. A lot of programs teach two letters in a pair um, these days. And kids can do that as long as that there's, there's lots of opportunities for review and repetition later. Um, and explicit handwriting support and practice. Um, it is. I have a four-year-old myself. I forget who else has a four-year-old. Yeah, and um, he's he's learning his alphabet right now. And like, I keep being like, he's already learned the alphabet. And I'm like, oh, he really hasn't actually, because there, it's so hard. I think we really underestimate how hard it is for kids to get all of these aspects of letter recognition integrated and automatic in their brains. To see a letter, to recognize the uppercase and lowercase, to link those together, to link those to the sounds, all have all of that happen um, and be really discreet about it. We all, And also to think about orientation too, right? Like in the real world, if I have a chair that's facing this way and a chair that's facing this way, those are both chairs, right? But now it's like one's a B and one's a D and you better not mix them up, you know? And so like all of that is actually really hard for kids. And so we want to make sure we're giving them um, really fast paced um, and supportive and explicit alphabet instruction. So that, that, that's one thing that I, uh, that I look for. When we come to phonics and spelling, um, what we don't want is lots and lots of different ways to recognize words. Like something like these, I don't know if you I have a big X over it, so you can't see it, but like Skippy the Frog and, um, you know, Chunky Monkey. Like, we, we don't want to teach kids that they have to learn, memorize 15 strategies to read words, right? Um, they just need to read the words <laughs> using what they know about letters and sounds. Um, we want to make sure that they aren't using meaning and context to guess words because then they're not paying attention to that, the, letter sound, the letters and sounds and they can't map it for next time. So they can use... If they're using meaning and context to guess, they won't, they'll lose the opportunity to learn that word and for the next time they encounter a text. Um, we want to make sure that we aren't just flashing, flashing cards of words at people, but actually even sight words or high frequency words, but giving them a chance to pay attention to how they sound and how they're spelled. We want to make sure that spelling is integrated with the phonics instruction. We don't want to have a separate spelling list that is sent home that they just memorize and then forget the next week. We want to make sure it's, it's also drawing on those letter sound relationships. Um, we don't want to teach nonsense words. That's a, an assessment tool. <laughs> it's not an instructional tool because we want kids to make sense of what they're reading. Um, and we want to make sure they have lots and lots of opportunities to practice. I see some in some science of reading schools, I see um, the phonics block getting very long, like 45 minute phonics lesson but no opportunities for like, but all isolated word practice, right? No opportunities to actually use it for connected text in reading and writing. And we don't want that. We want to make sure that they have lots and lots of opportunities to use what they're doing. So, um, so instead, what we want to do is think about supporting orthographic mapping and connecting to meaning in our phonics and spelling instruction. And we want to integrate those two things. So they need lots and lots of practice decoding and encoding letters part by part. And then we want to use meaning to confirm after they've decoded the word. Once they've decoded the word, then we talk about what it means. 
especially if it's in a, in a particular context, right? Because that helps them solidify that representation of the word in memory and will be make, it will strengthen those connections for the next time they encounter the word. So it's not that we're jettisoning meaning or context altogether. It's just that it comes after they've paid attention to the letters and the sounds, not before. Um, and we want to make sure that spelling and phonics instruction are integrated and kids are practicing reading and writing those words. All right, and then this is one of my particular things, multisyllabic words. Um, I think sometimes we are too focused on teaching kids to read single syllable words, and we don't pay enough attention to how we're teaching them to read longer words. But in fact, by the end of first grade, they need to read a ton of multisyllabic words, right? Like every word that has an apex is an a multisyllabic word. So we want to make sure that we're not moving too slow with, the, with our word instruction. Um, and that we don't spend a lot of time teaching kids how to divide words into syllables, um, and that we that and that we make sure that we're connecting to morphology and vocabulary, um, because what we find is that kids need prefixes and suffixes beginning in first grade. So we would think that what we're looking for is orthographic mapping and connecting to meaning in multisyllabic word instruction um, all the way through. Um, morphological instruction, especially when we focus on suffixes that change words from one part of speech to another is very important for supporting multisyllabic decoding. We want to make sure that when kids come across new word, long words in text, that they stop and pay attention to them and sound them out. Research shows that kids typically skip over them. So that hurricane text that we read, typically they would just ignore all those words. <laughs> they would not do what you do and try to figure out what they are. They'd just be like, well, I don't know that one. Well, I don't know that one. Um, so we want to make sure they're doing that. And we want to make sure that we integrate decoding and vocabulary strategies so we're always connecting back to meaning. Um, and morphology helps that, right? Because more like prefixes and suffixes change the meaning of the word. So thinking about those word parts can help you focus on the meaning of those words as well. Um, and then finally, the, one of the most important things is the text that kids read. I've talked about this a few times already, um, but we want to avoid telling kids that they are a J or an H. I had the same experience as Tanya, where like they kept sending my older son, they kept sending him home and saying, he's a D, he's reading at a level D. And I'm like, but he can't read. Like that's actually, he's memorizing those books, right? So we don't want to do that. We don't want to group kids or label kids either by books, right? We don't want to create a like, hierarchical system where kids are like, I'm a bad reader, right? Like we want to make sure that like, giving text ki kids text to read is like a, an affirming and exciting experience, not a punitive or like, high, you know, um, or, or a tracking experience. Um, and we want to make sure that kids aren't expected to read, spend long times reading silently in first grade. Um, most first graders can't read silently at all. They need to read out loud, right? Um, and we want to make sure that phonics instruction and reading practice are integrated. Um, so a, a long line, I, I won't get into this too much, but a long line of my research was about um, investigating leveled texts because those were very popular when I first started my uh, graduate program. And um, what Freddie Heber and I found, and like lots of other people have found also, is that there really isn't any significant difference in the difficulty of the words between a level A and a level J text. The, um, so these are three different word level predictors. One is mean log word frequency. That's just how frequent the words are in the text. One is decodability, and one is the difficulty of the vocabulary. Um, so the yellow line is vocabulary. So the vo vocabulary does get a little bit harder, um, but there's no statistical difference in decoding. Um, and in fact, like level B is harder than level D. Like it's kind of all over the place. There's no difference in word frequency. Um, <clears throat> do you want to? This was based on um, an analysis of. 510 level text from three different level text programs that we did. Um, and these, all of these indicators, by the way, are supposed to start at one and go to five. And they, none of them even start at one, right? Like even at level A, they're not at the easiest level. They're all start like the decodability starts halfway through the scale, right? So there's, the words don't really, aren't really easier in a level A text compared to a level J text. There is, um, the, the vocabulary is like a little bit less familiar as they go along, but not, um, it was a very weak statistical relationship. Um, the syntax is a little bit harder. Does anyone want to guess what the number one predictor of which level a text is assigned to is? You know. Yeah. Oh, the pictures. Yeah, we didn't even get into picture support, actually. We didn't analyze that, but absolutely, picture support would be huge. Um, but that was something we didn't, we couldn't capture in our statistically. So, but that would be huge. Something that you can measure in a number. 
The number of words, exactly. Level J texts are just longer than level A texts. That's like the main difference. So, so we, we don't want, so teachers tell me, you know, and I want to respect teachers and why they do what they do, right? Teachers tell me that they love level text because they love the idea that they could give a kid a text and know that they could read it. And I'm like, I love that idea too. It, it's not, it was never true. Like, <laughs> you know, that is not what was happening. Um, and so there's a real push for a shift to decodable text right? Um, and decodable texts do have some research evidence, not as much as we would like, but mostly that's because there aren't that many of them, or they haven't traditionally been that many on the market. And some of them are kind of awful as far as culturally affirming. Um, this is terrifying. Like, I, I don't know what the, like, what's going on with this guy. I mean, um, but like a lot of the decodable texts out there do not attend to meaning. They aren't interesting. They don't feature diverse characters or storylines or plots. Um, and so not like we, I, decodable texts absolutely align with the structured literacy approach, but they're not all the same. So what you do want is you want um, authentic texts, texts that feel like books to kids that are culturally relevant and matched to instruction. And then you want them to have, you wanna have a lot of those in your classroom so that they can just burn through them and build that reading fluency. Again, um, a lot of reading programs come with like, two decodable texts that like go with your lesson. And you're like, great, now what, right? Because they actually need a lot more vo reading volume than that to build up their reading fluency over time. Um, and we also want to make sure that they're reading informational texts. There's a, the tendency to make all decodable texts sort of just like little stories or whatever, but kids actually need experience reading informational texts to build up vocabulary and knowledge um, from the very beginning, you know, all the way through K3. We can't just expect them to start reading textbooks when they go to middle school. Um, so anyway, that in summary, what kids need is they do need that high level word instruction, but it's not just phonics. It's also connecting to meaning and making sure that they get lots and lots of reading opportunities. Um, it, but it's also connecting to meaning and making sense of those words. And then they need lots and lots of opportunities to build that in, in high quality text. And those two things have to go together. And that's what the science of reading tells us about teaching reading um, rather than those other things. So I'm happy to um, you know, stick around, answer any questions you might have. Thank you for your, your time today. I think, are you talking next, Jen? So I'll pull Jen's slide. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. All right, I think that's you. Thank you so much, yeah. Laura. Let's make sure I have our slides set up. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for everyone for being here, um, for all of our presenters, and I am going to be short and sweet, but I think after all of the information we just discussed, um, it is going to be an important part of um, your next steps in your district. Um, lots of decodables needed is kind of the message, right? That no matter what program you're using, what curriculum you're using, um, kids need um, access to a lot of decodable text. So again, I'm sorry, my name is Jennifer Ianazzo. I am the partnership manager for New York State. Um, so if your districts need decodable text, I would be the person that you will be speaking with. So just right reader, and we are gonna reference some of the materials that are on your table in these nice little envelopes. So if you wanna grab one of those, um, we're gonna reference some um, of the materials in there. So just right, Reader, how did we start? Um, well, our um, founder, Sarah Rich, back in 2019, she was a turnaround principal in San Francisco. Um, and how she came about starting Just Right Reader is really through her own experience, again, with her children. We heard a lot about that today, um, a lot of our presenters working through their children. Sarah, Sarah's daughter had trouble reading, um, and like we do, educators, we go into our book closets and we try to find something to help our own children um, in our environment. She went to do that. And you know what? Like Laura was just saying, the decodables just weren't up to par to what she would like to bring home to her daughter. So she said, you know what? We're going to tackle this problem. Um, and now fast forward to today, we have 700 plus titles of decodables um, ranging for all of your grade levels. I won't go all through this entire slide, but we always like to mention that we are really focused on the research and the science of reading research. Um, we are working with all of these wonderful researchers and actually even more now um, to make sure that the decodables that we create 
are the best on the market. Um, and you can see Laura's up there and Lucy. Um, so we can make sure our best, um, our best work is based on their best work. So Laura was just, it was a great segue because decodables, right? What were they? And I saw a couple of examples up there. Um, so now we would like to make sure that decodables are decodables that children can see themselves in, that they're about stories that the children um, are actually doing every day in their communities and with their families. So if you actually open up your envelope in that shrink wrapped in that there's like two there's two sets in the shrink wrap those are an example of our decodable so you can open up that <clears throat> and when you open there open up our decodable set those books you can see that explicit phonics instruction that phonics instruction is based on the english phonics project per progression chart um, we also have our full line of spanish decodables as well which we'll mention in a minute when you open up one of our decodables, um, you will see that explicit phonics instruction right away. You're gonna see the phonics skill, so that students, the teachers, the families, they know exactly what they will be learning through that decodable. You also can see deco your decodable words, your high frequency words, and also some fun activities based on that phonics skill. We like to call this our special sauce. Right. A lot of talk was um, a lot of talk from our presenters today were around how we teach phonics. Right. Everyone in our districts is not necessarily a literacy specialist um, and might need some help in teaching reading. Right. Teaching phonics. These are great resources for this. So um, I'm not going to ask you to <laughs> scan this right now. I usually do that in my presentations, but we are on video as well. So um, when you scan these um, QR codes, this will take you to an explicit phonics instruction for the phonics skill in that decodable. Right now, that QR code will take you to a lesson in English and in Spanish, okay? Um, we are building out our languages as we speak. So soon to come, we will have Arabic, we will have Mandarin, um, and actually the list is very long, but know that we are um, building out all of those languages to be accessible. We are a supplement. We are not a curriculum, okay? So any curriculum that you are using or program that you are using in your districts, we can align with, okay? So um, there's some up here if you're using something different. As long as they have a strong phonics um, basis in their program, we can align to that and help um, with your phonics decodables with those programs. When you think of Just Right Reader, we have two product lines, pretty simple. Right? We have our classroom libraries that we all want in our classrooms to have a, a number of texts. And then we also have our take-home decodable packs. We'll talk about classroom libraries first. As you can see, we have a full library in English and in Spanish, pre-emergent all the way up through second grade. And then we also have our high interest chapter book library. That library, to be perfectly honest, has been a lot more popular than I expected it um, to be. Um, those are really designed for once you get to second grade, there's a lot of students that still need that support. Um, so those high interest chapter book libraries are for that purpose for grades, we say through from three through five, but honestly can go past that as well. I'm working with a lot of middle schools, actually even some high schools that are looking at those for support, for supporting those kids. Take home decodable packs. This was another game changer for us. Um, and I know um, some of our presenters, like Tanya definitely rec um, talked about these. Um, so our take home decodable packs are really used for tiered support, okay? We wanna meet our learners where they are phonetically, and that might not be at grade level, right? For a lot of kids, those students, they still might be struggling. So what we're doing is we're taking data from your students, whether there's so many different data sets, right? But Acadians, Dibbles, iReady, um, and the list goes on. We can take that data for each individual student. And what we do is create a 10 pack of decodables at their level, okay? They come just like you see on the screen. Every student gets 10 decodables in that pack wrapped up just like a present. It's amazing to see videos of the kids opening these. Yes, there is a um, sample of these in your packs. 
Then when the students get these decodables, they can be used in class with the classroom teacher for those small group instruction. And I'm going to show you a little bit. I'll show you another slide about how a lot of districts are utilizing these just in different ways. In that pack, the 10 decodables will have a writing connection for each decodable. And on the back of the decodable, we call it high five. We want them reading and rereading those books so they can color those in as they go. And of course, they'll all have their QR code. Okay, great for homeschool connection. They're using these in school. They're taking them home to their families and can read them. These come in rounds. So we can have between one and up to 11 rounds for students all throughout the school year to support them and the teachers. We want our students to be super surprised about the books in their packs, but we want the teachers to know what students got. So we also include a nice list of which students got the same books in the class. So honestly, these are just your reading groups right away for phonetic support. All of our books also come with a lesson plan. Um, it is scripted, which is super helpful as we're moving towards um, phonics instruction. So let's hopefully do it the right way and we help we help with that. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize that. You also have a sample lesson plan. It looks like this on the table. And that matches one of the books that are in your um, wrapped package. Everyone get one of those? Okay, perfect. So those decodable packs, I just did want to mention the way I spoke of them before is really the um, way we design them to be used. But honestly, what has come out of the take-home decodable packs have been absolutely amazing. We are talking to districts all the time about summer programs, focusing on a, spe a specific number of students, taking their year-end data and creating packs for that focus support through the summer. All of the books come with lesson plans, so that's a great way to use these packs. In Cincinnati, they focus on their emergent bilingual population. Um, those students got an English pack and a Spanish pack. Um, so again, a different use, but very effective for those students. Spring bake break packs, you might not necessarily see a ton of growth, but if you want your students practicing over school breaks, that's another great way to use these. High dosage tutoring. There's so many districts now um, using it that have tutoring programs. Um, Decatur actually is using us for um, their tutoring program. And honestly, it was born from Decatur. Um, their superintendent walked through their tutoring program and said, we need something different. <laughs> this is just not effective. So that is what um, they're doing now. And they're using that um, focus data to create tutoring packs. So again, if you have another idea of how you'd like to use these in your district, we are able to help with that. Implementation. This is always the big question. How are we going to implement this? It's honestly a pretty easy lift. We're a supplement. We are not core curriculum. So um, when you're implementing this for your teachers, again, lots of resources and lots of support that we can provide. Like I said, a, a um, lesson plan for each book. We also have a lot of resources about how to get started, right, with, um, with decodable text in the classroom. For administrators, again, lots of resources, especially these symposiums, right, about around the science of reading. And also for families, those take-home packs, lots of family engagement, right? We have districts building their family engagement literacy around those take-home packs. So again, what, another way um, to support your students and families. Just a couple of highlights of our books. So if you look at your O is for Octopus book in your pack, that is a pre-emergent book. In the back of that book, you're going to notice that there are dry erase pages, okay? There are prompts for students to be tracing the letter. Then they can also use a dry erase to write the letter, and they can be used over and over. I like to highlight our high interest chapter decodables. Um, this, the book Swamps that's in your set is an example of these. Again, there's Laura. <laughs> she helped us develop these. Um, and again, highly decodable words. And if you look at the book, it's more appropriate, right, for your older student. We don't want to be giving them a book that might not be age appropriate. Um, but if you take a look in there, um, 
these are much more age appropriate. Also, lots of um, resource, like you see the story map online to support instruction with these. These are our new baby books, <laughs> our new baby board books. Um, so we can actually say we are supporting learners from zero all the way up now. And these are also on your tables. There's all different um, board books that you can check out. So um, we worked with Dr. John Hutton and Lucy Paulson on these. Um, and if you scan these QR codes, it's really helping families, right? We talk about the different, um, uh, the different topic of the book, but we talk about baby signs. We show um, the families how to do baby signs and why that's so important. We also talk about, let's say, tummy time. Why do tummy time? How does that support baby's brain and physical development? So again, if your district has early childhood or some feeder programs that go into your early childhood, these are a great resource.